Well, hey there, this is Cindy, and thanks so much for joining us today. I'm glad you are here and can't wait for you to hear today's episode. But just before we dive in, I thought I'd share just a few ways that we can work together if you happen to be looking to up-level your negotiation skills. I got everything from online to my signature one-on-one -on -one masterminds that's going to help you better leverage your innate power to get more of what you want and deserve in life. So if that sounds interesting, check out our site at artoffemininenegotiation.com. And now on to today's program, the reason you are here. I am very happy to introduce you to Kizzy Parks today. And we're going to be talking about how to negotiate lucrative government contracts. So this is an interesting little niche. So welcome, Kizzy. It's great to have you here. Well, thank you so much, Cindy. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I can't wait. I got a little pad and pen ready to take notes myself. This is an issue that I think many people shy away from. And for those of you out there, if you don't know Kizzy, Dr. Kizzy Parks is president of K Parks Consulting. And she's also a Guinness World Record holder for who's won over 50 million million dollars in government contracts. So that's pretty impressive chops. And through GovCon Winners Ultimate Edge, she is passionate about equipping service-based small business owners with the tools and the systems and the know-how so that they can win profitable government contracts without stressing over every step. So make sure you've got a pad and pen ready because you are not going to want to miss this. So kickstart us off, Kizzy, tell us, like, how did you come to do this line of work? It is a pretty niche and interesting area, I must say. Yeah, it, it totally is. It, it's started out, I was at work going down this like cubicle land. I'm walking down through these cubicles and out of nowhere, the director of research kind of pops out of nowhere. And he's like, Kizzy, you know, I need to talk to you. I heard you're graduating soon and I want to keep you on board. And I just was really shocked because I couldn't believe he even knew who I was because I was just kind of... <laughs> Yeah. You know, like this lowly intern kind of person. And he's like, so, you know, I want you to be a, a contractor and, you know, what, what dollar amount, what will it take? And I didn't even know what that term meant. I knew there were military members. I saw government employees and I saw these other people, but I didn't know what that really, that category meant. Yeah. And I just, I was bad at negotiating then. So I just threw out a number yeah. <laughs> based on like what my friends were making. And, and I was thinking how weird, because everyone could hear us in the, yeah. in the little cubicle land. And he was so <laughs> thrilled and was like, yes. And he's like, okay, I'm gonna have you talk to my assistant. And that was 10 years ago and when I well over 10 years ago. And when I first started through that experience in the hall, I was really honed in on kind of the expert route. Yeah. I was the go-to for diversity and inclusion, data analytics. That was my wheelhouse. And then as time went on, I learned I needed to really scale to be a success in federal yeah. contracting. Okay. All right. Now, I often say our first and most important negotiation is the one with ourselves, you know, negotiating our mindset. And I know a lot of people, when they hear government contracts, they probably, you know, had that little shiver. So, you know, what tips do you have for our listeners to start on how they can negotiate their own mindset to help them step up and be open to taking a crack at trying to get these contracts? I think the best way to really approach it is sometimes there are these warnings or things are made to appear more difficult than what they are. So for instance, technology. Yeah. Right. It, it can be, I know, for myself, it can be very overwhelming and I want someone to fix things and I want them to fix it immediately and I don't even know where to start. And so as a result, often they can charge a lot of money, but you could also go on YouTube and take a look or maybe call a friend or call some other tech support and save a lot of money. But because it just has this air of like difficulty yeah. and challenge, people kind of have deer and headlight kind of expression <laughs> when it comes to it. Yeah. And the same happens with government contracting is that the reality is kind of like with technology, after you use it for a while, you're like, oh man, I can't believe I thought this was so hard hard using this yeah. new iPhone, you know, 25. And you're like, <laughs> I got this in two minutes now. And it's, it's like the same thing with government contracting, where it's like this cloud is put out like, oh, it's so hard. And there's all this red tape. And you know, this one gentleman I'm mentoring, he's won about $100,000 in work in 1.2 months. Wow. I mean, it's a space where if you're really willing to go there yeah. and really, you know, leverage your negotiating skills, the sky's the 
limit when it comes to the government. So it's got to work on that mindset of just realizing that sometimes people position things as being more difficult than what they are because they want to keep you out. Yes. Yeah, I totally get that. And I understand it's like a $500 billion market in the US alone that's at stake here. So can you give us just some examples of like the range of contracts, the types of contracts that might be available for the taking out there? Yeah, wide range. So for instance, another person I mentor, she'll bid on HVAC contracts, floor replacement, okay. floor cleaning, painting, upgrading a parking lot. Yeah. These are some examples. Other yeah. examples consist of leadership training, presentation training, save a back training is another one that is really popular with the federal government, as well as they'll purchase staffing. So they need people to support the full-time government people. Yeah. So they may look for graphic designers, those in medical, those in IT, those in cybersecurity. And then you also have a big area in just overall construction of constructing buildings, moving materials through trucking, and everything and anything in between from drum sets to, I mean, human cadaver training yeah. <laughs> to oh they need someone to take care of some horses. Yeah. I mean, it really runs the gamut as far as, as what they, they need. And they, they can't go to Amazon per se to buy these things. So really it's like from A to Z, like just about any kind of service you could provide, there is the potential for you to be able to get these contracts. Now, I know a lot of people think, oh, with the government, I think one of the reasons a lot of people step back is, oh, it's got to be, you have to be connected. What, what do you have to say to those people who are, who have that as their naysayer? You don't have to be connected at all. The thing is, when I first started out, there were about three of us who were offered a similar kind of arrangement. I'm the only one who's still in this space. Yeah. So if having that connection was the, you know, almighty force, <laughs> then all of us yeah. would still be yeah. going to come. <laughs> and it's, it's not the case at all. What's really important is that you're willing to deliver the thing that they want to buy. Yeah. That's okay. number one. Yeah. The second thing is that you are willing to be, you know, nice, easy to work with. You have some humility. They're going to love that. And third, you realize that the government buys things the way that they want to buy them. And you're cool <laughs> with that. Yeah. <laughs> <Good. laughs> yeah. I love it. And so how long would it take? Like, let's say when somebody's working with you, because I know you bring that expertise and help people through this process. So how long would it take for our listeners out there? If they're like, hmm, I'd be interested in following up on this. What can they expect in terms of time commitment to work with you to be able to get them to where they need to be? At the end of the day, it really is based on each and every single person yeah. that I coach that I mean with anything in life you know yeah. the amount of effort you put in is is sure. based on the results that you're going to get so working with me your probability of getting winning profitable contracts is going to be way, way higher than if you do it on your own, because the Small Business Administration has shown it can take on average 14 to 16 months to get your first contract, which is, a, you know, can be a really long time. Yeah. And so with working with me, the time commitment is pretty nominal in that I have a kind of done for you yeah. where we provide the opportunities, provide the templates, provide all of the expertise, help walk you through how to approach different government stakeholders, yeah. how to really navigate so that you're able to provide a bid or a proposal yeah. that the agency really wants to go with. Okay. Now I know you've got sort of a patented, if you will, your signature five phase approach to winning those profitable sort of government contracts. Can you, obviously you can't teach your whole programming here, but can you give us some of the highlights for each other? Like, let's start with phase one. What is sort of the, the phase one of your approach just to give people some context to the structure what the yes. Phase one is in many terms, it's like the business basics where there are requirements that the federal government has in order for you to be that main, what we call prime contractor. And it involves registering in certain systems called SAM.gov, like Uncle Sam. Yeah. And even if you're registered in it, you may think, oh, I've already done that. Well, there's a profile that I also review because often that profile is missing key information that can be preventing you from getting opportunities. 
So it's, it's more than just getting you in. It's also walking you through yeah. the profile and for you to really understand the importance of that system. And also it's getting into other systems that are important to be able to look at opportunities. There's kind of like a business card per se, kind of marketing material that's in the government space. And we handle that for you yeah. so that you don't have to worry about it because there's some expectations that the government has. And so those are the foundational items, whether you have them or not, we can review yeah. them and tweak them for you. It's really important to have them because it shows a government agency that you are established. Even if you started your business three weeks ago, yeah. it doesn't matter. <laughs> it still, it shows them, oh, wow, you know, you really have all your ducks in a row and they're going to really like that. Yeah, that's awesome. And then as they move, so they get there. And again, these are things, as you say, people would be like, there's just so much information out there, most people wouldn't know where to start. So I love the idea of having someone like you who's able to sort of just navigate through that challenging. Pre it's like going on a trip somewhere where it's some exotic country and you're just totally dropped and lost. And then you've got a guide who comes and takes you to all of the highlights. So you get to see everything you need to in a short time. So what about phase two? What, what's the next step once you get all those sort of registrations and profiling and everything set up? Well, we really talk about the mindset is really important yes. because what will happen is you you, we approach things from what we know. Yeah. So especially if you're already entrepreneurial, you have your kind of way of doing things. But with the federal government, they have their way of doing things. And so it's really important to understand kind of their perspective, their mindset. Uh, there's information provided by former government employees to talk about kind of what they're looking for. It's really key because several years ago, a company lost a contract that my flagship company ended up winning. And it was mm. well over, it was about $4 million is wow. what the award was for. Yeah. And so it was because of a misstep around mindset wow. and around meeting the expectations of that agency. And so it's that powerful because the thing about the federal government is at any point in time, they can say game over, we're not working with yeah. you anymore. Well, and I love that mindset piece. And it's interesting as you're saying that, because I got like, my book just came out, The Art of Feminine Negotiation. And I talk about taking an inside out approach, always starting with the psychology, starting yes. with the importance of mindset. But I focus more on starting with our own mindset, which is important, but you pick up that extra piece. You got to know the mindset mindset of the, of the other party that you're going to be dealing with in a negotiation if you're going to be effective. Because ultimately, if you're not convinced, if you're not persuasive and in influencing them about what you bring to the table for them, then all the great mindset in the world that you have yourself isn't going to help you. So I love that you actually spend time on that. I think that's beautiful. And then where do you go after that once you got them, it sort of got their head around. So they got their sort of foundational elements. Now they got that mindset, both theirs and the other parties. Where do you take them in phase three? We then start to talk more about bidding, and then we go a little bit into marketing, but really into bidding, into what's needed. Yeah. Because there's paths that you can take and you can win a contract in a few weeks just because of the nature of what it, they're looking for. So for instance, tree trimming. Yeah. If an agency wants tree trimming in Ohio, you find a company who provides a tree trimming, you add on your profit. And if you wow. win, you've won. And at the end of the day, it's tree trimming, right? Yeah. You're, you're, you're either going to trim the tree or you're not going to trim the tree. <laughs> It's really not that big of a deal when it comes yeah. to risk, right? Yeah. So there are some really quick wins out there that are available to you. Yeah. So it's good to talk about that as well as the more, the larger opportunities and how to approach those being those that are hundreds of thousands of dollars to hundreds of millions of dollars to know what's really needed. Yeah, beautiful. And then to sort of round it out, what sort of phase four and five for us? Well, we talk about like networking and we also talk about executing the contract because all along what's really key are those relationships yeah. but also knowing how to really encounter and navigate those relationships because what I've found is people make these mistakes of they go in there and they're like this is my company this is what I've done these are the awards I'm so amazing yes yes and it's like <laughs> they don't want any of that they want to know about them and how you're going to be able to help them or how you've helped people similar to them so we spend a lot of time on that as well as executing the work because that's another area where I've seen several individuals and companies really fail is that they get the work it's 
it's exciting. It's amazing. And then they're like, oh no, how am I going to do this? Yeah. Or you may run into situations along the road. And the thing is about the federal government, they're a great place for second money. Meaning once you get in, you have a contract and you deliver, yeah. it's easier for you to either get additional contracts or for them to add more to your existing contracts. So really knowing how to execute that contract is key because it's not like Amazon where you yeah. get the wrong item, you send it back, no <laughs> harm, no foul, you keep it moving. Yeah. It's not like that with the federal government. They're they're going to remember you and they're not going to want to work with you again. Yeah. Well, and I'm really glad that you spoke to that idea about what's in it for the other party, not because it's, it's one of the things I talk about in negotiating generally. We so often bring that ego to the table, right? And we do make the focus all about us. And I see people may, a lot of my clients make this mistake over and over going in for a promotion or a salary increase request. And it's all about, well, I have this skill and I have that skill. And they're talking all about themselves thinking that's a sale. Ultimately, they don't care unless you can tie that back to what's that going to do for the organization. So for our listeners out there, just to put a pin in that, whether you're negotiating personally for your own salary increase, or whether you are following in Kizzy's footsteps here and looking for those big ticket government contracts, those principles are the same. The other party wants to know what is in it for them. So when you're able to get that mindset, as Kizzy says, that's a game changer, I would think. I love that. So Kizzy, let's use mine, for example, just to get and not to take through the whole process. But let's say if I wanted to get in and get a government contract, you talked about leadership sort of training or whatever. So about that sort of communication, how to see everything as a negotiation and be able to get those better results. So what kind of things would I, should I, could I be doing for that? Well, there's a couple of approaches. So I have direct partnership are the key terms here. So <laughs> direct would be you registering and you responding to different opportunities for leadership-based training. Yep. There are a ton of them. There's leadership training, and then there's also diversity training, which at the end of the day really involves leadership. And then they have different trainings out there with all different titles. So that's one route. The other route is through partnerships. So I work with my clients and students so that they are able to identify, and I would recommend that to you, yeah. different government vendors who may be looking for someone like yourself Smart. to have as a 1099. Then that way you don't have to register. Yeah. You don't have to market. You're not responding to proposals. You may not make as much, but 30% yeah. or something's better than nothing, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so that's the, the beauty of it. And then what will often happen is this, the agency would engage with you. So yeah. they get to know you, Miss Cindy. Yeah. They don't know the company who won. They know you. Yeah. So then eventually they're going to say, well, is there more things you could do for us? Yeah. That's smart. And then it, it turns into you getting additional work because they're really getting to know you or, and I know this isn't the goal, but I'm just letting you know, this yeah. is kind of where it will go. <laughs> Sometimes they will ask if you want to apply for a job that happened to me. Yeah. When I first started out, the director yeah. of the entire organization at that time, he's like, man, I really want you to stay on in a government, in a GS 13 yeah. position. And I said, I'm not looking for a job. I want to be an entrepreneur, yeah. but it was a very, you know, flattering, yeah, but that's, it is a compliment, you know, but yeah. that's the beauty of this space is it can easily turn into that just on the commercial side. It happens too, but that's, that's just kind of how I would approach things. If I were in your situation. I love that. And again, I hope for our listeners, generalize that concept. That's why I'd ask that question for you as well. And the theme I'm getting here to is don't go in with a preset idea about what it has to look like, right? I often talk about don't get too attached to what the outcome is that you're looking for. I hear Kizzy saying, have an open mind. There's there's many ways to approach these to be able to get where you want to be at the end of the day if you're open to it. And just while I'm thinking about it, Kizzy, when you were talking about those partnership relationships, so obviously you're in the US, you've got this inside out, backwards and forwards, you know, the federal contact. Do you also work with people outside of the United States? Like if somebody came to you from Canada or somewhere else, would you be able to work with them to help them navigate the system? Of course, because you can register as a federal government contractor, even if you don't live in the United States. 
Okay, beautiful. So everybody so I, pay attention. Yeah. <laughs> there are, I mean, there's lots of opportunities to get involved in this government contracting space, especially if you live in Canada or you live in another country. The biggest thing is it may be a little challenging if you live in countries where the US is having a conflict with. I mean, just being very, you know, open about it, that can cause a problem. But otherwise, it also boils down to the type of opportunities. Yeah. So if there are opportunities that are low risk and they're like, listen, we just need somebody to provide fencing material and yeah. you're able to make that happen. They could care less. They just want the fencing material. Yeah. You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah. And I would assume that the principles that you sort of teach or train or work with people on would be applicable in any event. So not only would they be able to register in the US, but presumably you'd be given the skill set to be able to go after those contracts in their own country. Is that fair? Yeah, that's very fair. As well as you may even be able to participate at the state level. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of state, local, county opportunities. And what I share on my strategies apply to those areas too, as well as there are companies looking for partners. Yeah. So you could always go that route too. Great. Now, any tips on crafting the perfect pitch? I know that I'm, well, I'm assuming, I shouldn't say I know, I'm assuming that getting that pitch is going to be an important part of the process. Any tips for us on that? The big tip is you really want to take that situation, action, result approach where you want to be able to talk about something you worked on or someone you worked with or a client you had. Yeah. And what was that situation? Yeah. What action was taken? Was it you delivered? the fence? Was it you coached them? Was it you provided staffing? Was it some IT app you created? And then also what was the outcome of that? What was the result of working with them? And especially highlight, were there any awards? Was there money saved? Did they then bring you on for additional work? Because they're looking to be able to see themselves in what you share. Yes. Because we can all share how you know amazing we are, but it's like Yelp. We need to go on Yelp to see it or yeah. trust pilot. And by you providing that example, it at least gives them kind of that micro Yelp experience. And that is the way to go about it. And to also ask them a lot of questions as well as getting to know them. Yeah. Because this is a people game. And yeah. the more that they like you, they're going to want to do more work with you or to do work with you. Yeah, that just makes sense. What do you find are the biggest mistakes that people make around negotiating government contracts or trying to negotiate government contracts? <sighs> One is they're entitled uh, is yeah. they think, oh, well, I, I'm a small business. And I've, I've had some people share that like, oh, well, I contacted this government person and I said, I'm a small business. And why aren't you giving it to me? Uh, no one's going to want to work with you. Yeah. <laughs> no one. <laughs> I mean, they're just not, they're not going to want to work with you. So that's a, a big one. The other one is giving up too soon. Oh, that's a good one. Giving up way too soon. There's thousands upon thousands of opportunities every single day. Yeah. And as long as you're willing to sell according to how they're looking to buy, yeah. there's no shortage of yeah. things to sell. There's yeah. no shortage. <laughs> and so- but people give up like, oh, I, I responded to two opportunities and I didn't went to that. Yeah. You responded to two, you know, yeah. so that's a big one. And then lastly, this misbelief that you have to have a set aside or you have to be connected. It's like, it's this thought that it's outside. Yes. And not that you, it's not that you control everything. Of course we don't, right? We have our areas that we're able to control, but there's a lot that you can control. You can control how you network. You can control having people fall in love with you and want them to put you in the family photos. You can control <laughs> what you're bidding. You like, there's so many areas you can control on control. And so kind of eliminating all of these like myths and negativity is really key because so many fall into that hole of like, well, I don't have, and then yeah. they end up not getting anything. They don't win anything. Oh, and that is such great advice in life. Like not only for negotiating government contracts, but my gosh, as you were saying, that I'm thinking like that mindset piece where, oh, we have a couple of, you know, where we fall down instead of getting up and brush ourselves off and celebrating the so-called failure to learn from it, have a failabration, as I call it, people quit. And I remember why I can't remember who it was, I think it was Dean Graziosi was talking about, if you look at life and people, it, it, we all assume that if we're, as we're progressing, we're going to be going up on a graph at like this 45 degree angle, just ever, ever up. But he said, the reality is you go flat, 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 flat. And most people quit when they're at the flat stage and they, most people quit 
just before it doesn't go on a 45 degree, you'll be flat. And all of a sudden, boom, you're going to be taking off at like an 89 degree angle. But if you quit before you hit that, which for many people is just before it would have paid off for them. So I think that's such a valuable lesson in life, both personally and professionally, as well as government contracts. So what role do you think preparation plays, would you say, in these kinds of negotiations? Preparation is really important because you're often not only negotiating with the government, but also with the supplier, uh-huh. whether it's an yeah. employee, whether it's the tree trimming company, yeah. it's another 1099, it's to buy a supply. So you need to really make sure you are prepared to yeah. have different discussions. You know your numbers, you have things in order. So then you can deliver because you, at the end of the day, by any and all means necessary, you have to be able to deliver what you are claiming you're able to do. Yeah. Yeah. And it sounds like kind of being our shark tank, right? You see some of them show up and they're just like, I've got this great idea. Here I am. But if they don't come armed with the data, right? To be be able to convince, then you're not going to be getting picked up. So that just makes sense. I love that. <laughs> and what role do you find, if any, does gender play a role, I guess, is what I'm asking in any of these negotiations, do you think? Either in terms of how people show up differently, how they're received differently, different styles. What's What's been your experience around that? You know, when it comes to gender, I have found that people just, it's a space where people respond to me based on how they respond to me. Yeah. And when I say that, it's, you know, you're going to like me, you're not going to like yeah. me. Totally. And the more that someone is going to like me, the better. And what I have found is that I definitely have a lot of male fan club members is what I call them. Yeah. (laughs) And so that's actually been really helpful. That's interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I call them fan club members. And so I've had a lot of fan club members that are really helpful. So I've also had experiences where there are women who have no interest in me whatsoever and don't want anything to do with me. But who knows why? It could be that they have another vendor in mind. It could be they just don't care for me. It could be I'm not a good fit. Who knows? I've also come across women who adore me and we've worked magically together and they they're very satisfied with the products and services that we've provided so in my experience what's been really helpful across the board is you having a strong understanding of your morals your ethics Mm. your kind of mission and vision in life and you're going to be okay yeah nice and uh, what i'm loving so much about this conversation is i this is super helpful for people to open your mind to the idea about going for those government contracts. But so much of what you're talking about here today, because he also applies, as I say, across the board, any negotiation in life, right? Being able to bring that. And on that, what would you say are kind of the key skills or hallmarks that make for the best negotiators? And I think you've talked about some, that relationship, that ability to get them to know, like, and trust you. What are some of the other skills that you think help make for better negotiators in this niche, if you will? It's kind of micro listening, Mm. where you're listening to them. Yeah. You may even practice where you rephrase or restate what they said. So you show them you're listening, but you also are, you're practicing micro listening because you're also picking up on some of the onset. So for instance, there was a situation with one of my clients and the government agency said something along the lines of, you know, we have a policy where this particular product needs to be manufactured in America. And we've had some situations where they were bringing in product from another country. Mm-hmm. And this person said it a couple of times. So yeah. I shared with my my client, I said, that's a huge flag. You know, yeah. it's part of the micro listening. The person's yeah. basically trying to tell you he knows that this is a problem. So then you need to be aware yeah. as you're looking for vendors that yeah. you don't get duped and you end up with the wrong product. Yeah. And so those are some of the things you have to listen for because they're not always going to be very blunt and open and honest because you also have to keep in mind in these kind of scenarios is when it comes to the federal government, these are jobs that come with amazing benefits and these are positions people could have forever. Yeah. Theoretically, it's so that urgency, that environment, that rah, 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 kind of corporate what? go, go, go isn't really there. So some people may not be so fortunate 
forthcoming because, you know, it's just another day in their life of working for the federal government. Yeah. So beautiful. I love that. So it's such important. This has been eye opening for me as well. I'm super excited about it. And again, for our listeners, I want to really put a pin in some of those things that kizzy has been sharing with us here in terms of how you show up. And particularly on this listening piece, it is one of the most important skills in negotiating. And I hate to say it, but in North America, especially, we do not listen well. We are not taught to listen. We wait for our turn to speak. You know, we're thinking about what we're going to say. We make assumptions that we already know what the person is thinking or saying. So we don't listen even at the base level, let alone. And I love, Kizzy, when you talk about that micro listening, because there's a whole, there's those layers in there that can make all the different people who get the best outcomes are people who show up with curiosity, people who put themselves in the shoes of the other party, in this case, the government, you know, the whoever's giving the contract and you listen and you question and you reflect back so that there's no misunderstanding and that the other party feels fully heard and validated. So such great skill sets across the board. Thank you so much for sharing. And normally I like, I can't believe how quickly our time is going here. <laughs> I always like to end by asking what is one of the greatest mindset shifts that you've ever had in your life, Kizzy? And it can be around this, but it doesn't have to be. It could be just one of those aha moments for you that changed how you show up. The biggest mind shift I had was a brown perfectionism. Ah, yes. <laughs> I, I knew I struggled with it, but I had no idea that it impacted everything, especially yeah. in my business. I remember I was working, I was in my office, I'm working diligently on this proposal. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm just, I'm just going to give them a C minus. I, I'm only going to yeah. be able to give them what I can give them. Yeah. It is what it is. I'm just going to turn it in. And sure enough, that agency went with it and it was like a little over $200,000. <laughs> and I said to myself, oh my gosh, this whole time yeah. I've been projecting this perfectionism into government proposals and creating all of these expectations and requirements that weren't really there when this agency went with something that was good enough. Yeah. So then I really shifted and started using language with my company yeah. around good enough. It just has to be good enough. So it just has to be good enough. Yeah. doesn't mean it's bad. It doesn't mean it's, it's amazing. And we're you know so focused on perfectionism. It's about, does it meet the requirement? Yeah. And that has freed me. It's like I lost 500 pounds. Yeah. It, really it was the best thing that had ever, ever happened to me. One of the greatest things. Oh, that is such a great tip. I think we are so, and, and women in particular, I think really tend to be very subject to this. And I have come to that as well. Get done is better than perfect, right? So long as it is done well, it doesn't have to be perfect. And the difference between here to here, the extra effort you're putting there does not pay off in the same way that that first effort does. So that's such a great, yeah. great tip. So tell our listeners, Kizzy, how can people find out about you? Where do you want them to go if they're interested in getting more of what you got to offer? Yes, I have lots of places, you know, definitely check out govconwinners.com to sign up for the wait list. Yeah. You can check out my YouTube channel. Kizzy M Parks is a great place to go. I'm on LinkedIn. If you're into LinkedIn, please connect with me. Mention that you heard or watched the show as well as you can always email me because I love emails at kparks at at govconwinners.com, kparks at govconwinners.com. So please connect with me. I would love to provide any kind of help or assistance that you may need in this government contracting space. I love it. And we'll make sure for our, our listeners out there, you don't have to worry if you didn't get that down. We will make sure that is in the show notes. So be sure to check that out and follow up. It sounds like there's something for everybody out there. So I definitely encourage you to reach out to Kizzy and check that out. I know I will be certainly. So thanks so much for being here, Kizzy. You have loved this. It's been an eye opener for me as I'm sure it has been for all of our listeners and viewers. So thank you. No, thank you. This has been awesome, Cindy. Thank you so much. <laughs> and for all of you out there, I am sure you got loads of value from this episode. This is, we'd usually talk about sort of negotiations generally. This is very specific and pointed, and I hope it opened up your perspective. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast if you haven't done that. And I always say, give the gift of sharing. Make sure to share this episode with anybody that you know that has a business or something they offer that maybe this would be incredibly valuable for them as well. And also make sure to grab my copy of Art of Feminine Negotiation book that is out. And that is a wrap for this episode. So until next time, go forth and negotiate your best life on your terms so that you can stop missing out and start getting more of what you want and deserve from the boardroom to the bedroom. Until next time, take care.